In this class we'll be concerned with contractual terms. These are important, very important within the context of the law of contract. Um, as we'll see in a second, terms are the basis of the contract. But we need to widen it and talk about how terms come about, how they're implied, what happens when there's ambiguity about the terms. So there are many issues associated with terms that we need to address. Let's start and talk about the nature of terms. Well, for a start, a contract is made up of terms. That's what a contract is. It specifies the terms. They are simply promises uh, or acts requested in the contract. That's all a term is. It's, it's a, a written, or it could be unwritten, but generally it could be a written term that specifies what is required in the contract. But as I said, that could be implied and it may not be, it may not be in paper form. We'll see how this works out later. If any of the terms are breached, the remedy is breach of contract. So there is an action that can be taken by a claimant upon the other party in the contract for breach of contract if a term is, is breached, if a term is not adhered to. And as I said, the terms can be either expressed, written on paper, or implied, implied as in understood between the two parties, understood in a way that enables them to have a contract. The intention was to have a contract, they've got a contract and they understand what the terms are. Now I want to look at what's meant by express and implied terms. Express terms are agreed by the parties in words. There's no ambiguity here. You go up front and you say what should be in the contract. This is an expressed term. Implied terms are implied either by the courts or by statute. Implied terms uh, sometimes because of custom and, and habit or tradition that even though there is a contract with expressed terms understood explicitly by both parties. There are also implied terms because the industry has always done it that way. So there is an implied term that it will be done in the same manner. So it's not written but it's implied and the courts would take that into account. If there's any conflict between an expressed term and an implied term, the expressed term will prevail unless the implied term has a, uh, is a statutory one which cannot be changed. So generally speaking what's written or understood on a handshake perhaps when the contract came into existence that is expressed and that will stand in preference to an implied term. An implied term is one that nobody has mentioned but is custom and habit within the industry or within that sector or whatever so when there is a, a conflict between the two, the express term will win unless the implied term has its basis in law, in some statute passed by, by Parliament. Terms can be implied by the courts. These are customary terms. The courts have power to imply terms into contracts but they, they're not prepared to make a contract for the parties. So the courts can imply a contract, uh, imply a term and say there was, there was a term in there that perhaps wasn't mentioned but there is one because of custom, because of tradition, because of the way the, the business is run, because of the way the industry is run, because of the type of society it is or whatever. There is an implied term even though it's not specified. Uh, there, there was a case, um, the Moorcock case in 1889. Um, I, I'll, I'll produce those uh, in more detail in a separate, uh, separate material. However, just to um, solve the curiosity here, the Moorcock case was about um, a ship 
and a mooring on the Thames. Um, the ship owner and the person who owned the mooring had an agreement uh, that the, the ship could be moored there. Now the Thames is, is a, a tidal river so the the level of the, the river rises and falls with the tides. Um, the ship owner recognised this and, and knew that when the tide went out his ship would rest on the bottom and that was the understanding, that was the agreement. Um, however when the tide went out the ship came down, rested on the bottom but also rested on some rocks which damaged the ship. So the ship owner took the person who owned the mooring to court saying that, that there, was, uh, there was damage and uh, wanted compensation for, um, for damage to the ship. Um, the court said there was actually an implied term that uh, the implied term was that someone could moor their ship there safely and that should have been made explicit at the time the contract was drawn. So the court implied the term, implied the term that the mooring was safe. A term can become customary between parties to a contract if they regularly make contracts. Um, so if there's a regular contract between them and then when they draw up the next contract perhaps they don't say everything, They're, they understand what should be in the contract. However sometimes it leads to issues but this was um, originally set down in law in a case of Hutton versus Warren in 1836. Uh, again briefly to allay your curiosity, um, the, the claimant was a farmer who had a tenance, uh, tenden, uh, tenancy, sorry, had a tenancy and the, the defendant ended the tenancy. So the, the claimant then sent a bill to the landowner and said uh, that he would like compensation for the seed that he had planted and for the work he had done up to that point. Uh, the defendant said there was no such contract between them and there was no compensation uh, due. So it went to court. Um, the court said there was an implied term uh, that tradition and custom within the farming community meant that it was always done that way. So there was an implied term and that therefore uh, the defendant would have to would have to pay. Some terms are implied into particular types of contract as a matter of law because such terms are always implied into the type of contract in question. It may sound complicated but sometimes terms are simply implied into particular types of contract. Um, the case here the relevant case here is Liverpool City Council versus Irwin, 1977. Again, just to allay your curiosity, um, this was a, a situation where there was a block of flats. Irwin was um, a tenant. Um, the council owned the block of flats and did not maintain the common areas. So the common areas came into, fell into disrepair. Um, the residents were angry about this and held a, a rent strike that refused to pay the, the city council the rent. So the city council responded by trying to evict Erwin for not paying the rent. Uh, Erwin went to court and said the council had an implied um, obligation, obligation uh, to maintain the common areas of the flat or the flats. Um, and this was upheld. The court said there was an implied term that the city council should maintain the common areas as the landlord. So implied terms can come from various directions. 
Now let's have a, a talk about the limitations. Um, well, there are limits to terms implied by the courts. Um, in this case, uh, Trollop versus the NWRHB, I think that's uh, uh, a tenants association, um, a society for for tenants associations. Uh, the limits are that the court will not make a contract for the parties. That's what Lord Pearson was saying. The court will not even approve the contract which the parties have made for themselves, no matter how desirable the improvement might be. An unexpressed term can be implied if and only if the court finds the parties must have intended that term to form part of their contract. It must have been a term which went without saying, a term necessary to give business efficacy to the contract. So an implied term it must be obvious. It must be it must be there so obvious that the, the parties drawing up the, the contract didn't mention it. And in fact if you think back to one of the earlier cases I talked about there and say the Moorcock case where the ship um, got damaged on the rocks, uh, we would now think that the the person that owned the mooring and drew the contract should have mentioned that. Uh, to us now it's, it's a pretty obvious thing to do. So, but there are limits. The, the courts will not draw the contract or improve the contract. The courts will only deal with the contract that comes in front of them. Terms implied by statute can never be excluded. So contracts can never exclude statute law. The law of the land is the law of the land and people may have an agreement about anything but it must be in accordance with the law of the land. Drawing up a contract does not mean you can exclude legislation. Now let's look at the, the types of terms. Um, all terms can be classified as being either conditions, warranties, or innominate terms. Well, uh, these sound interesting. Um, an innominate term, we'll deal with conditions and warranties in a moment, but an innominate term, this is a fairly new one, uh, it was introduced in the Hong Kong Fair 1962 case. Uh, any term is breached, uh, if any term is breached, the injured party will always have a remedy for breach of contract. Okay, that seems reasonable. The nature of that remedy will depend upon what type of terms or what type of term was breached. In nominate is not a warranty or a condition. It is any other breach. That may sound a bit strange, but uh, well, we'll have a look at the the Hong Kong fur case. Let's let's go back and look at the conditions and warranties first, and we'll come back to the in nominate. So, conditions and warranties. Okay, a condition is a term which seemed very important when the contract was made. Condition is extremely important. A term which went to the root of the contract. Uh, so a condition is extremely important. A warranty is a term which did not seem vitally important when the contract was made. Um, a term which did not go to the root of the contract. Um, in the case of Passard versus Spears and Pond, 1876, uh, this was a, a case about uh, Passard was was a singer and had a contract with uh, Spears and Pond to sing 
in London. I think it was Madame Passard. I think she was French. Anyway, she was to sing in London and the contract was drawn. However, just before uh, rehearsals properly got on the way, uh, she was taken ill. And so Pearson Pond found a substitute singer so the show could go on. And after several weeks when uh, Madame Passard was, was better, she she wanted to, to join the, the show. But they refused to have her and so she, she sued for wrongful or her husband actually sued for wrongful uh, dismissal. And it went to the it went to the courts. Um the court said that um the action would, would fail. It was rejected by the courts. Uh, they said that Spears and Pond could rescind the contract because it was unfair for them to have to go back and uh, re-engage a new singer, re-engage the, the whole uh, theatre and, and, and change the performance and integrate a new singer. It would be it was simply unfair. There was uh, an understanding uh, that the show would continue with the substitute singer. So, uh, Mr. Passard failed in his, his attempt to uh, uh, get his wife reinstated. Now we'll deal with this, these nominate terms. These were introduced in the case of Hong Kong Fur Case in 1962. Uh, this was a this was a case about a ship that was um, chartered for two years, and after a few weeks, the ship broke down. The engine broke down. It took five weeks to fix the engine and another 15 weeks to make it make it ready. Um, the company chartering the ship sued and said look it was a, this is a breach of contract because the ship should have been seaworthy in the first place and it went to court uh, it was contested by the owners of the ship who said um, cancelling or sending the, the contract was unfair uh, the court looked at the conditions and the warranties and it was fairly obvious that on those accounts that there was going to be uh, the contract could be rescinded. However, they introduced a new term here, the nominate term, which falls between these. Um, the idea here is that the defendant uh, would still get benefit sorry the defendant would have the rest of the time period and would get benefit from the rest of the time period um, and the person bringing the action or the company bringing the action the claimant or the claimants they um, they would have the substantial part of the contract so there wasn't a major component of the contract missing and therefore the contract could not be rescinded. The two, 20 weeks out of two years was not substantial enough and that became the anomalous part. So it was the, the action was dealt with not in terms of conditions and warranties but in terms of um, was it significant? Was the time period significant? And 20 weeks out of two years was held not to be significant. So therefore uh, the contract was still in place. Um, the, for nominate terms the court asked to consider whether or not the breach deprived the injured party of substantially the whole benefit of the contract. Now if it did 
the injured party can claim damages but cannot rescind the contract it cannot terminate the contract if it did not the injured party can treat the contract as terminated and claim damages so the court simply asks does the breach deprive the injured party of substantially and it, it introduces a, a vagueness in the law here what do we mean by substantially it's not as clear cut as is it yes or is it no is it substantially and that's open to interpretation and that's why in nominate terms are seen as difficult they're difficult to interpret they're difficult to understand conditions and warranties haven't been replaced by nominate terms if a condition is not met that's at the root of the contract that's serious that is a termination of the contract warranties these are minor terms but at the same time important and could lead to a termination of the contract in nominate neither of those it's this new is, is there still benefit flowing from one party to the other and is that significant and is it significant enough to ensure that the contract continues right so all of, as if all of that was not bad enough we now deal with the difficulties with types of terms there is some uncertainty as to whether the courts can classify a term as a condition a warranty or an nominate term but there is some guide, guidelines law or statutes illustrate a term as a condition or a warranty so laws or statutes can't be overwritten in contract they take primal position the parties to a contract decide themselves whether a particular term gives right to termination or not so the way around the innominate issue is to specify at the time the contract's blown up what is important and what is not important what what could lead to a termination and what would not lead to a termination it means the contract would be quite complex to draw up and perhaps many terms would have to be anticipated and written in if a term is not any of the above the the, the courts regarded as a nominate that's open to this interpretation uh, are the benefits that have already uh, gone from one party to the other or will go from one party to the other for the rest of the duration of the contract are they significant does it mean that significantly the contract can be can be honored or substantially can it be honored if it if it is the case then the contract would continue and that's known as an innominate term now terms implied by statute well in the UK there are many statutes and many other countries have copied these and written them into their laws but the sale of goods act 1979 supply of goods implied terms act 73 supply of goods and service act 1982 and parliament is is constantly looking into revisions in these laws and updating the law as more court uh, cases relating to the interpretation of the law come forward the terms which these statutes imply are inserted into certain types of contract without the parties needing to agree to them as I said earlier you can't override the law in a contract so two people may draw a contract but the law of the land statute law still remains in place and both parties are bound by it a contract does not replace it Um, even if the parties expressly agree not to have the term in the consumer act contract the term will still apply 
So even even if two parties are drawing a contract and they say, look, the Sale of Goods Act will not apply to us, it still will apply. There is no way in which it can be removed. It is above contract. Okay, so in this session we've talked about the terms. We've looked at how implied terms come about. We have looked at the types of terms, conditions, warranties, and in nominate. Um, the confusion would come with the interpretation of a nominate. Try to see it as it's not a condition, it's not a warranty, it's another area where the contract could fail, but it may not fail, it depends on interpretation. If in the full duration of the contract a significant amount of benefit can be derived from the contract for both parties, then the courts would uh, deem that the contract should still stay in place, even though perhaps um, there was some some belief on one of the parties' sides that the contract should be terminated. And this would be based on this idea of a nominate in a nominate term. So that's what we've got from this particular video, I hope. Um, I find that that um, web address is excellent and strongly recommended to you. Uh, it's very well done and it's very clear. So congratulations to the owners of that site. Um, but I'd, I'd recommend that one to you. And that concludes this video. So thank you for watching.